Alright, this is good? Okay. Yeah. Yep, so it's recording and you're good. Alright. So, welcome everyone. I guess no one can give me a thumbs up if they can hear me or not, so we'll just hope for the best there. Um, <laughs> Okay, we can, okay, we're good. So, awesome. Well, thank you guys for attending virtually um, for our Burpee Museum lecture series. I'm Stu Cook. I'm one of the educators here um, at the Burpee. Um, but before I came here, I um, have done a lot of work uh, with Amber Research over in Montana, which I'll kind of be speaking to you uh, about today. And so a lot of this research has been done um, with the Carter County Museum over in Ecolaca, Montana. A lot of Burpee regulars might be a little familiar with uh, the CCM and the Ecolaca region. So all the research um, that I'm going to be talking about today is from that region, which is really cool. So um, let's get into it. All right, so uh, in my time kind of researching Amber, I've kind of had my worldviews flipped around a little bit in perceiving the past and kind of picturing it in my own mind. So I grew up a dinosaur lover, lover, so oftentimes when I picture the past, I imagine really majestic scenes such as this, of uh, you know, all your charismatic megafauna in one still shot, kind of like here in this Jurassic Park still. Um, but really, if you were to go back in the past, it's not necessarily uh, you're going to go to Yellowstone National Park and see a bear, a bison, and a moose all in the same shot. You're probably going to be seeing them individually, or you're going to see a lot more common animals like insects. And so when I think about the past these days, I kind of lean toward something a little more like this. You know, a mosquito haven. Picture me circa 68 million years ago in my time machine. So what am I trying to say here? No, I don't think there was giant mosquitoes roaming back then, eating baby dinosaurs, or giant grasshoppers from the Cretaceous, terrorizing crops and other plants. Um, but I do think, generally with a lot of people, including myself, we have a preconceived picture of what the past was really like. You know, I often uh, picture the charismatic megafauna and stuff like that. Um, because, you know, maybe a, a, tri a fly isn't as charismatic as a triceratops or a mammoth, maybe, but it's also because there's a lot of things to be figured out and discovered um, insect-wise throughout our geologic history. And we're still trying to figure that out to this day. So, um, a little background of insects. Insects have been on this planet for nearly 400 million years. And um, to this day, they're one of the most... Um, species and diverse organisms on the planet, especially in terrestrial ecosystems. They are most definitely the, uh, the most species organism um, on land. And then also just biomass wise, they have an incredible amount of biomass. At any one point, there are somewhere in between 10 quintillion uh, insects alive at any one point um, right now as we're talking. And so put that in perspective, that's about the distance between us in miles, um, between the Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy. And so, you know, there's a lot of cool insects out there. There's a lot to be uh, figuring out. Entomology is a huge field. But if you go into paleoentomology, it's a bit of a different story. So that brings me to my title. Um, so by the end of this talk, I hope I can uh, present my research to all of you, give you some cool background knowledge of like what we're discovering, what this project is about. Um, and hopefully get you thinking about kind of our smaller denizens of our planet. And so before I really get started, I just want to call out and give a shout out to um, this cowboy looking dude right here. This is Nathan Carroll, or Dr. Nathan Carroll. He is the curator at the Cardi County Museum. He was also my mentor uh, when I began working in the paleontology field. And um, he was the original founder of the Hell Creek Amber Project. And so a lot of the work that I've done is built upon um, the stuff he's been doing. So, uh, speaking of Nathan Carroll, uh, the curator of the Carter County Museum, Carter County is this small county right here. The Burpee Museum goes there every summer to do uh, paleontological field digs. And in Carter County, uh, there's about 1,500 people in the whole county. It covers about 3,000 square miles or so. Um, and then it also contains about 100 million years of history. So everything from 
uh, marine reptiles, dinosaurs, and famous bronc riders um, have all happened here in Carter County. Right there, yeah. So let's zoom in a little bit. In the town of Ekalaka, population 399, uh, we have an incredible uh, museum here. This is where I got my start. Um, in fact, if you were here during the early 2000s, you'd probably find a toddler version of me giving tours throughout the, the dinosaur museum. And so, yeah. So we have some really cool examples of fossils that have come out of the region. Some are really world-renowned. Um, we have an incredible specimen of banana titan, or Montosaurus, I should say. Um, we have incredible pachycephalosaurus skulls coming out of the region, as well as triceratops. And um, having grown up in Ekalaka, I feel a little homesick sometimes being living here in Illinois. But I do have some old neighbors to keep me company. So we have Jane here at the Burpee, as well as Homer. So, uh, to give a little background, and for those not familiar with the Hell Creek Formation, the Hell Creek is a unit of rock uh, found in eastern Montana, as well as the Dakotas and Wyoming. And this unit of rock contains a lot of the last dinosaurs that really exist on the planet until the last days of the Cretaceous period, um, kind of up here. So, we take a little closer look and stroll back the clock. Uh, sea levels were a lot higher back then. We had the Rocky Mountains starting to uplift and get really high during this time period, as well as a, a receding interior sea. And so here we are um, near the Ekalaka, eastern Montana region. All these dark purple rocks on this geological map represent the Hell Creek Formation. So this is where all those rocks are, with containing all those dinosaur fossils. It's been an incredibly important formation um, historically because it's one of the biggest uh, dinosaur localities in the world. Hundreds of thousands of dinosaur fossils have come out of this region, um, as well as other types of vertebrates. And it's also butting up against um, the KPG boundary. So some, people, some of you may uh, be familiar with uh, the KPG mass extinction, which is the large extinction that took out the non-avian dinosaurs, as well as a number of other taxa. Um, and then we also have the overlying uh, Fort Union formation, which is a Paleocene formation right over here. And so we actually have rocks before and directly after um, that mass extinction event, which is really cool. This, the, that sequence of rocks has been incredibly important in understanding extinction mechanisms um, and the history of our planet and its life. We go to the Hell Creek Formation today in uh, Carter County. It looks a bit like this. We have these, these tall mud buttes composed of siltstones and sandstones and mudstones. It's a pretty arid environment. There's not a lot of water uh, in this region. But if we were to turn back the clock about 66 million years ago or so, there we go, uh, we will find a very different looking environment. There's tons of water, um, fluvial systems like rivers and lakes and um, swamps all the good stuff. The environment was really subtropical, so you have tons of uh, a variety of animal and plant life, everything from crocodiles, turtles, um, and flowering plants and pine trees. We have a lot of different um, organisms living here during this time period. And so insect-wise, though, uh, there hasn't been a lot of research looking into the Hell Creek insects, mostly because they're not there. If you look throughout the fossil record, uh, the record of small organisms like insects is pretty sparse in comparison to um, animals like vertebrates with a backbone because of what we call the preservation potential. And so the preservation potential is really just how well um, an organism is going to be preserved in certain environments, the potential of it being preserved. And so in the Hell Creek, there's a huge bias towards large-bodied boned animals uh, to be preserved. Small animals like insects really, with really delicate bodies, they're not going to be preserved very well. In fact, up until recently, uh, the only real evidence that we have of insects in the Hell Creek are from trace fossils, it's like right here. So we have um, some leaf feeding traces on these leaves. So you can see these margins of these leaves have been fed upon by uh, herbivorous insects. And so based on the pattern of these uh, feeding traces, we could actually determine the type of insect taxa and genera um, that produce these. Up until now, it's changing a little bit from the trace fossils, thankfully. And so Hell Creek Amber lies in a particularly interesting point of time um, in the geological record. 
So if we look on our geologic time scale right here, I have highlighted a bunch of different um, amber deposits found throughout the world. And you may notice, so here's the Hell Creek formation right here on our scale right before the KBG. There is significant gaps in this amber record, and this is just from the Cretaceous to the Paleogene. And so one of these gaps I like to point out is right here between the um, beginning of the Maastrichtian period and then up until the late Paleocene. There, there are very rarely um, deposits of amber found within this time period. And if there are, they're not terribly fossil, um, fossiliferous. So the Hell Creek Amber uh, story is incredibly, it's gonna be incredibly important for understanding what is happening between these points. So, you know, we can say, okay, we know some insect taxa were existing here. They're not over here, so we can probably say they may not have made it across the KPG boundary. But if we wanna be more um, um, analytical and get some closer data, we're gonna need to find some evidence in between this boundary. So that's why Hell Creek Amber is gonna be pretty huge in understanding the story of these micro ecosystems and the KPG extinction. So, I have a lot of time to talk about amber, so you, I, you all can hear me ramble about it. And so I'm just going to give a kind of a crash course on it, because I think it's a really cool subject. And so amber, if you guys are familiar with Jurassic Park, remove anything from Jurassic Park in your mind. I don't want to hear any of that. So, amber, from the health, or amber is not sap. It's not fossilized sap. That's one thing I want. If you remember anything from this presentation, I want you to remember that amber is actually tree resin. And so this resin is very different from a sap. Sap is nutritious, it's very sugary. Resin is disgusting. You cannot get anything out of resin. And so resin, um, it's typically made of a combination of um, alkaloids and terpenes, and they really just kind of, uh, uh, is a conglomerate of uh, polymers. And so essentially it's related to plastics and stuff. And so just another polymer. Um, trees use it in a variety of ways, and they use it um, for sealing wounds, like if they have a broken limb or maybe a scratch in the tree trunk. But they they'll start producing this resin to cover that up, kind of like a wound sealer, because that'll prevent any pathogen or infection kind of setting in on the tree. And also, it's pretty toxic against insects. It's a pretty good deterrent for insects, as you can see here. And so, amber, the, am the amberization, so people like to call it, is essentially not, it's not fossilization. Sometimes it's referred to as um, fossil resin or sometimes amber is considered a gemstone. Those are kind of erroneous. In fact, it's, it's really a polymer. The only thing that has changed from this point to this point is how well connected all of these polymer chains are to each other, how much they bonded to each other. And so there's some inter interesting interactions between um, certain terpenes and alkaloids kind of exiting and off-gassing um, from amber. But then over time, all those chains are gonna be connecting together and forming um, a stronger, more glass-like substance instead of really gooey, flowing substance, as you can see here. And so like I mentioned, um, resin is an incredibly important part of a tree's defense system because there's a lot of things that are going to take advantage of an organism that can't physically move. And so, you know, they're great wound sealers because they block um, infections and pathogens like this blue stain fungus. This is a huge problem in the Midwest right now paired with the uh, uh, Western Mountain Pine Beetle. These two have been working in tandem to take down a lot of forests um, in the Rocky Mountain regions. And so, these guys will come in and their larvae will feed on the wood, the heartwood, and they'll also introduce this blue stained fungus, which will, is very deadly to the trees. Then you also get guys like aphids that feed on the sap of the tree. They're sucking up all that glucose and those sugars. And then you also get um, interesting parasitoids too. So you get types of wasps and other insects that will actually lay their eggs inside of trees and then their larvae will go in and be eating the heartwood or um, all the nutrients inside of trees. So amber has had a long history on our planet. The earliest evidence of amber being produced by plants is about 320 million years ago or so, back in the Carboniferous, so the mid-Carboniferous. Um, and so it's been on our planet for a while. But it, so it's, it's had a long history geologically, and I won't touch too much upon other amber deposits. 
but I would like to mention some interesting histories of human interactions with amber. Um, so one thing I forgot to mention earlier uh, is the different type of ambers we have out there because within each deposit, you're going to have a wide, or between each deposit, you're going to have a wide variety of uh, distinctions between ambers. And so each deposit is going to be unique in its own way because it's going to be affected on uh, the kind of chemical makeup that this uh, resin had, uh, how old it is, how it was preserved, and a bunch of other different factors that can preserve how it looks and what other kind of properties it has. And so the amberization process can take sometimes millions of years, depending on the environment, to actually happen for all those polymer chains to um, interlock and bind together. What I'd call an intermediate amber, or an amber that hasn't fully uh, polymerized yet, and those are sometimes referred to as copals. And so we have some fun examples um, here in person of some copals. Uh, but you can also see here we have some copals here. And for thousands of years, humans, really since we kind of became humans, we've been using ambers and copals in our lifestyles. And so copals are commonly used as jewelry. So in polish it and make it into jewelry or statues. It's made into incense. And it can also be made into different varnishes too. And so like protecting um, wood surfaces and other things like that. The Baltics region um, of Europe has an incredibly long history of um, amber collecting. And so here we can see some fun examples of amber fishermen basically netting pieces of amber out of the waves because that's how you find amber in the Baltic region. You just kind of find it washing up on the shores. And so most commonly kind of turned into jewelry or they can be used into varnishes, turned into uh, in for industrial purposes. Um, here's a really fun photo of uh, New Zealand amber miners. And so they really just kind of trenched out looking for these ancient thousand year old copals to be used for different industrial purposes. And so pretty big effect on our society. Amber jewelry is quite impressive and quite old. So here's an example of a bear figurine from the Mesolithic. Here's a Bronze Age cup made from amber, cool Roman mask, and a, a bust from China made in the 1700s. So these are really incredible um, examples of jewelry and art forms that I like to show. But probably the most impressive uh, piece of amber history within human history, I think, is the Amber Room. So it's a really crazy story of uh, Prussian royalty and Nazis, actually. So if we go back to the Amber Room's first inception, it was commissioned by uh, Prussian royalty back in the 1700s. And the idea was to just have a room paneled with amber. And so you can see this is a colorized image of a black and white photo taken um, of the old amber room. And so we have massive panels of amber covering the walls. We have amber statues and amber picture frames. Everything in this room was supposed to be made of amber. It was quite impressive in its time, but it was never really completed. It just kind of switched between different experts and uh, uh, constructors and trying to make this amber room. So it traded hands a lot within Prussian royalty and eventually it made it uh, made its way to Russia. Um, I think it was, I think Frederick the first of Russia finally received it. And it's every time it's been passed on, it's been added on to. And eventually uh, it was getting near completion towards the 1940s, but we can all imagine what happened in the 1940s around 1941 uh, Germans began the invasion of the Soviet Union. And so when that invasion happened, uh, the Russians were really wanting to preserve this amber room, and so they were attempting to try to take it down and move it. But by this time, it was already tens of years old, and so all that amber became very brittle over time and kind of started to break. And so it was very difficult to try to move this thing. And so what happened is they tried to hide it. All they did was put wallpaper over it. didn't really trick the Germans very well. And so <laughs> they found it behind the wallpaper, they dismantled it without breaking it somehow, and they moved it over to a castle uh, somewhere in Prussia. And so what happened after that um, 
1945, Hitler ordered the looting of a bunch of different arts um, from the region that it was located in, and so it was all dismantled and taken down. And past that, the history is a little murky. We don't really know what happened to the Amber Roof. A lot of people say um, the castle was bombed and the Amber Room was inside it. It wasn't moved yet. Some people say it was aboard ships and submarines that sank. And somewhere those are, it's in the back in the Baltic Sea where the Amber originally came from. But no one really knows what happened. No one can corroborate what actually happened to the history of it. And so it's a really fun piece of history I like to um, talk about. Uh, it, in the 1970s, late 1970s, it was recommissioned by the Russian government, and so they have a replica of it um, somewhere near uh, St. Petersburg. So here's the new uh, reconstruction of the Amber Room in all its glory. Yeah, and so I think it's really fun to mention this really intrinsic uh, and close-knit history that humans have had with Amber for thousands of years. All right, so let's kind of get back more into the subject. Sorry for that side, that side quest there. But anyway, so amber, uh, like I was saying earlier, it can vary very uh, remarkably between deposits. And so you can have a lot of different textures and properties. One cool property is color. And so even within deposits, color can drastically vary depending on the type of chemicals and preservation that amber has undergone. And so you can find a bunch of really cool colors commonly. They're usually reds to yellows to oranges, but in some places like the Dominican Republic, or uh, Dominican Republic, you can have green ambers. And then in Africa, there is a deposit where you can actually find blue ambers as well. So pretty amazing um, varieties. If you look at amber deposits around the world, they're really everywhere. I couldn't list all of the amber deposits everywhere. And so I just listed the 12 main ones here. These are the 12 main rigorously studied deposits around the world. Um, we may recognize uh, uh, the Baltic amber over here. We have uh, the Myanmar amber deposits over here in Asia, the Dominican Republic in North America. Then we have some really cool Mesozoic deposits of amber in Canada as well. New Jersey amber, of course. Um, and then the Hell Creek amber. Hell Creek Amber has really not been studied historically, and it wasn't until 2010 um, when Robert De Palma published the first reported insect inclusions in Hell Creek Amber. But besides that, there hasn't been much more published material, and so we're some of the only researchers working in this field. Uh, and so this project has really been culminating in a way to truly preserve uh, this amber because what we find is that it's extremely brittle. It's not like Baltic, Baltic amber where you can really just slap it on a polishing wheel and turn it into jewelry. With this stuff you can really just crush it in between your fingers and turn it to dust. It's very easy to disintegrate. And so creating a methodology was a huge part of this project in determining how to get this amber out of the field into the lab without it breaking down and falling apart because all amber is really vulnerable to a lot of environmental conditions like UV exposure, oxygen, um, humidity and temperature differences. And so you got to watch out for a lot of that. And so over the years we've been trying to develop a methodology and we've been working on the body, um, other bodies of research that other people have done. Um, and so I'm going to kind of lay out our methodology right now. And for another reference point, that is one centimeter. Another obstacle in this project is the size. So commonly, Hell Creek Amber are small droplets on the centimeter scale. And so unfortunately, we're not going to be finding any full baby birds or dinosaur tails in this amber just yet. Well, stay tuned, maybe. And so here we are out in the field. What we'd like to do is we like to search for organic rich deposits like coal seams or organic rich mudstones. And we'll go in and start digging um, in places where we commonly find amber eroding out. Amber eroding out of a hill is a good sign that there's probably a good deposit there. And so we'll dig in with certain tools like pickaxes and awls and um, dig knives. And eventually when we do find a piece of amber, what we're going to do is we're going to put it in a film canister. And so this film canister keeps uh, it safe from UV rays. And we'll also put a damp piece of paper towel in there as well to um, provide some humidity so it doesn't dry out. Because when amber is exposed to these different conditions, it cracks and microfractures. 
And so it'll often obstruct any inclusions or insects that are inside of it, or it'll fracture so much it'll just fall apart. So we want to keep it useful. And so once we get it back to the lab, we're going to take it out of all those canisters, uh, put it in a sieve and wash it in distilled water, make sure to get all the dirt and mud off. And then we're going to put it in a climate controlled room um, so it can uh, uh, dry out properly. And then we can put it in epoxy resin. And so we embed it in epoxy. This provides a stable environment for it so it doesn't crack over time. And then at this point, we're able to pop it under a microscope and start surveying for inclusions. And so you can get a lot of information um, from this amber just by looking at it under a microscope. You can find inclusions that way. You can get some characters um, and details from inclusions with a microscope. But sometimes you got to do something a little more drastic. Sometimes uh, part of an inclusion might be obstructed by something. So we might have to shave it, shave part of the amber piece off. And it's also another thing, like you have this piece of amber that has inclusion inside this big epoxy puck but you gotta get back at it so, somehow. So we use grinders and a series of saws to refine the amber even further and isolate pieces that have um, inclusions inside them. And so we get a better look at them under the microscope. But then at this point, we can also pop it into um, CT scanners. So we uh, do microcomputed tomography, which is really just a fancy way to x-ray these things in 3D. And so here is um, a Hell Creek Amber inclusion. Um, inside of a micro CT scanner at the university, the Keck School of Medicine in uh, California, UCM. And so if anybody's gotten an MRI or uh, x-ray done, or might be a little familiar with this process. So we really just take an inclusion, we put it in an x-ray, and then this machine, these CT scanners, will take a series of different uh, slices. And so each of these is a really small on the micron scale slice of the amber piece. And then once you get all these slices, you can put them together with software and create a 3D model. And so through this way, we're hoping to get a lot of other characters and parse out some characteristics on these inclusions. And so here's an example of an inclusion that we scan uh, with the CT scanner. It's a little rough. We're still refining the process um, of scanning these things. And so through all this work, um, I'd like to talk about the field work we've done. And so throughout the county um, in these amber deposits, we've discovered a few different taphonomic facies or where these ambers are preserved. And so in the Hell Creek, you really can find amber anywhere. A lot of dino diggers out there um, in the median, you might have found amber digging out in the Hell Creek in your bone beds or just looking around on the ground. It can be found anywhere. But in certain deposits, you're going to find it more commonly. And in these deposits, we're finding some interesting shapes. I know amber shapes, really exciting, right? <laughs> and so amber shapes, we call them original exudation shapes. And these original exudation shapes is a really fancy word for saying it looks the same when it came out of the tree. And so we're talking about droplets and runules. And so here's some cool examples. Here is a little droplet. Here's some really fun looking droplets. You see, you see, it really looks like it just came out of the tree just yesterday. Here's another example. Here's a really fun runny wool. So it's just gonna imagine it falling down, dripping down from a tree. And we've also been finding some big ones actually too. And so um, until recently, we've been doing this research since about 2014, um, we've been finding bigger and bigger specimens. And so these are on the multi-centimeter scale, which is really cool. So it's one at the top and near the bottom. I think these are definitely just ru big runules of resin that came off this tree when it was damaged. This one in the middle here has been a little interesting because when we took it out, these pieces kind of, we kind they, they came out in pieces. We couldn't preserve them in their full glory. So we took a lot of pictures beforehand. This one, we actually jacketed. So just like a dinosaur bone, we put it in a field jacket to preserve all of it. And so at some point, um, I then took it to a hospital in Bozeman, Montana, working with the MOR. We put it into a CT scanner. And I don't have a picture of it, but cross sections of this guy, you can actually see it's layered. It's kind of layered like a, what is that hostess, that hostess dessert? 
It's like the chocolate one with like the circle, circle. Swiss cake. Yeah, it's like a Swiss cake roll inside of this thing. And so it actually has rings inside of it. And they're almost re reminiscent to growth rings of a tree. And so either this is an extremely uh, interesting case of runules kind of flowing over old um, and, or resin flows, or it's actually a, a limb of a tree that has been completely inundated with resin and it's just preserved like that. It happens in some cases. You can find full stumps or um, tree limbs that have just turned to amber because of so much resin that was inside of the tree itself. So we're still trying to figure that out. It's a pretty interesting specimen. I'm hoping to learn more about it. Um, here are some pretty interesting specimens and also kind of shows the diversity of when you're out in Hell Creek, you find a lot of different kinds of amber. So you have these really amazing looking original exudation shapes but then you're also finding these really chunky, we call it punky, pieces of amber that don't really preserve much in terms of like, I don't know, I don't know, like, I wouldn't even say that thing looks like amber, but it is amber. And so what we're learning from all these things is that a lot of these deposits preserve these original exudation shapes. And you're probably asking like, oh my God, just go on to the insects. Like, why do we care about these? they're actually incredibly important for figuring out why these deposits are generating and how they're generating. So you can imagine if you're thinking about that ta the taphonomy of um, a dinosaur dig site or how those bones got there, we need to look at how the amber is structured itself to figure out if it came from somewhere else or if it was right there. Because figuring out if this amber was produced um, and buried right in that very spot where we dug it up is quite important in figuring out if we can trust the dates of these amber deposits. Because other ones like in the Baltic, they are in a completely different rock layer than when they were um, originally deposited. So you have a lot of secondary erosion happening where these things are traveling sometimes hundreds of miles from where it originally came from. And so this is an important part of the story, trying to figure out the story of Hell Creek Amber and what we can use it for. And so here are some screenshots of some interesting um, parts and, and specimens and localities that we have around the Hell Creek. We have an interesting little uh, plant, possibly from a cypress tree with some preserved amber. This is going to be really important in figuring out what tree was producing this. We have some pretty cool amber pieces coming out of the rocks here. So let's go over some of the sites. This is the Took site that we have. This is one of the first amber sites we have. Um, or had discovered back in 2014. And so this is really just a lignite bed on top of a mud butte. And so in this, you find some pieces of amber. We haven't found a lot of inclusions because the amber is kind of sparse in this. Lignites we found aren't the best always for preserving amber. But another, the, the really interesting deposits come from organic mudstones or carbonaceous mudstones where you have a ton of organic matter built up right in here. So all of this, you can see all these tiny little cool preserved uh, leaves and needles. We have full-on uh, sticks, carbonized sticks in these deposits. Here's another example of one of those deposits. We sometimes find amber just right on pole seams, and so it was probably sitting in uh, the actual tree limb or stick when it was buried, and so you have that all preserved right there. Here's some of the more interesting ones we've been finding way out on the uh, eastern sides of the county. And so right here, this is a really cool deposit because it's not in these mudstones and lignites, these really low energy environments. They're actually uh, in silts and sandstones. And so it's likely these pieces of amber were knocking around a river for quite some time before they actually deposited, um, came out of the river channel. Um, and so we're still trying to figure out the taphonomy of all these sites and what it really means um, where we're finding these. Because uh, figuring out amber taphonomy is a little tougher than going back into the literature and searching because no one has done work on how amber or resin behaves in a fluvial environment. So like we don't know how abrasion works on tree resin as it's going down a river. Unlike bones, we have tons of cool taphonomic studies kind of detailing what happens to bones or shells being washed around by waves or rivers. We don't really know what happens to amber um, over time being transported in rivers or wave or have the action of waves. And so there's still a lot to learn about what it really means that we're finding uh, certain exudation shapes in certain environments or not. 
Um, here's another screenshot of another uh, amber site on the eastern side. We have these really mass accumulations of droplets just in this one little scene here. Probably saw some of those on those previous slides. Here's just a big explosion of amber on the surface. You can kind of see the lignite seam and carbonaceous uh, cold layers kind of around here. And these carbonaceous mudstones, you're finding some really cool stuff aside from amber. Here you can actually see three different um, tree limbs. And so we have one right here, we have another one, and then one right here that's really interesting because if you think about coals, coals are made just from the compression of plant matter. But some of these things are preserving in 3D. And so it's not a completely flattened log. It's still preserving some uh, three-dimensional features of these logs. And so it's not completely compressed. It's compressed to a degree, obviously, because you can't really have coal form without a little compression. But so we're still having some interesting 3D preservation. So like right here, we have a massive log. I don't have a picture, but um, one of my volunteers helping me dig out was the, was the original scale bar for this log because it's nearly three feet long. Um, not in total in this picture, because it's just a section of it. But here you can see a three-dimensionally preserved limb of the tree, and it's still going into the hill. We still haven't dug this guy up. And so through all this work, we were beginning to hypothesize that maybe a lot of these amber sites are autochthonous, which really means in situ. And so we were thinking this amber came from that very spot, but I'm beginning to second guess it because of the unknowns of how amber really behaves in transport in these river systems. And so I think it's a little um, up to debate on where this amber is coming from. So we have a few different models of like how this amber is getting here. And so it's possibly like you have these um, rivers kind of coming through here. And over time, we have oxbow lakes kind of shooting off and have amber falling off the trees into the oxbow lake. Or maybe you're having flood events like crevasse glaze kind of going inwards um, on floodplains and depositing it through there and either having the amber coming downstream and being deposited during these flooding events. Or maybe they're just dropping from the trees directly. And so maybe that's an explanation of why we're seeing um, original exudation shapes and then also just like these other pieces of amber that don't look like droplets or what you'd traditionally think of as a uh, exudation shape. All right, so now we'll get to the good stuff. I still got some time. So since 2014, we've been uh, digging up amber in Carter County and um, we've found a multitude of inclusions so far. And so I'll show you guys some of the best ones. There is a lot of I don't know what that is. We still have a lot of work to do in trying to figure out some of these mysterious ones. Some of these look really plant-like or maybe fungal-like, like these might be um, hyphae, um, mycelium, possibly some sort of plant matter. No idea. Possibly um, this might be an antenna or some sort of um, palp of an insect. No idea. And then these really weird uh, kind of moldy, mold shape, mold-like mold structures that may be uh, trace fossils within the amber. So you can imagine an insect doesn't always get fully stuck in the amber and it might just, you know, it might escape, but it leaves behind like a little, like a little footprint in the amber. Or possibly there was an insect in this space here and then it just eroded out and didn't preserve well. And so all we have left is just an empty shell of where an inclusion might have been. So there's a lot to still figure out on this end of things. Here's a really interesting one that um, is kind of new. Last time I talked uh, about Amber uh, in Illinois was at PaleoFest 2020, right before lockdown. And so there's a lot that's happened since then. I can't remember if I showed this one during PaleoFest or not. But we have this really teardrop shape inclusion here. And you can tell there was actually a lot of air bubbles kind of surrounding it. So there was a lot of off-gassing of air um, from this thing. And so we actually got a CT scan of it. It's a really strange shape. We still don't know what it is. I'm kind of leaning towards it might, might be an egg or a pupil case of an insect. So if you look here, here are some examples of modern uh, Raphidiopteran um, uh, pupil case or egg cases. And they, uh, like think about lace wings, those really kind of cool green colored insects you find um, in the summer months. They put their um, 
eggs on stalks, these really weird gooey stalks, and then they'll eventually hatch out, and there's other insects that pupate, kind of like a cocoon, you can imagine, that have these shapes like this. Um, hopefully we can CT scan it and maybe there's something preserved inside, so like maybe the developing insect inside of it, if it is um, sort of de uh, developmental feature. Here's actually one of the first inclusions that we came upon. Uh, this is a, um, um, blanking on the word, a serum, uh, serenomid fly, I'm probably wrong on that. So these flies are related to modern day midges and um, blood sucking flies like gnats. And so you can kind of see, here's a really cool looking, you can see his um, head shield right here. Um, here's his head, here's his mouth parts, there's his antenna. His wings are not preserved very well. His wings are kind of not there, or what we can't see. And you can kind of actually see some of his abdomen and his lower legs. Here's uh, one of the first specimens I discovered while searching and surveying through amber. And so this is a tiny hemipterin um, that isn't really around today, but it's re distantly related to modern day aphids. And so you can kind of see his legs are tucked in there and then he has antenna. But there's this weird thing kind of shooting out of the back of his butt. And it's not his butt, it's actually the opposite. It's actually his mouth. And so these insects are incredibly uh, specialized for feeding on uh, plants. And so what they do is they have this massive straw-like mouth part that comes down They'll fly and find a tree, mostly likely the, in, like the, the leaves of the tree or maybe the joints between sticks, and they'll stick this mouth part into the tree and suck out all the sap and the nutrients. And so they're incredibly important pests um, in uh, vegetation. And so that's pretty cool. It's like he's probably feeding on the exact tree that entrapped him for millions of years, and so we can actually see him today. We have some mystery ones over here. So he's kind of hard to see, but you can kind of see his shadow right here. This one was interesting because he was actually cleaved off. And so half of him is exposed to um, the open air, or I should say the open epoxy at this point because it's been embedded. And the other half of them, the, the pretty side is facing the other way. And so we, don't, can't, we can't get a really good look at him. So he'd be a good candidate for popping into a, CD, a CT scan and getting a good 3D model. Here's another one. This one's really cool because we don't really get color preserved in a lot of these. Some other amber deposits, they can preserve um, things like different pigments or um, just different shapes that may represent different colors or the different segments of an abdomen. But you can actually see some variation in the abdomen preservation here. And so it looks like it's just the abdomen, but we do have a really long leg poking out the back here, here's a wing, and then he's actually curled up kind of like that. Sorry, virtual people can't see my laser pointer, but anyway, he's curled up to a point where his head and his thorax is mostly hidden. Here's another interesting one. This is one is also cleaved in half, and so all you can see is an empty body cavity and then just the very um, fine layer of cuticle that would be on the body, and so the, the non-visible half of them is probably a lot prettier looking if we could flip them over, but sadly this uh, piece of amber is really highly microfractured, so we don't really get a great look at them. All we can see is this empty body cavity and these really long legs, long front legs that he has, which are pretty interesting, likely a type of fly. Um, sorry, let me go back. So a lot of these things are really troublesome because a lot of this amber and the inclusions inside them aren't preserved very well. Most cases, we just have the empty body cavity of these insects, and so sometimes not even the outer cuticle is preserved, and so it's really just, sometimes we call it ghosting, in that it's really just a ghost of what actually used to be there, and so there was a lot of um, decay and decomposition happening within the amber um, while it was being preserved. And so sometimes, if I go back here, Find a better specimen. This one, we, don't, we aren't able to see its wings or its legs, and so it's incredibly hard to parse out characters to try to identify these things to the right genera and taxa that they belong to, and so it's going to be a lot of work trying to figure this out. Even popping them into a CT scanner, there's obviously going to be a density difference between a hollow limb and then the amber surrounding it, but so far we've really had um, 
a troubling time trying to get an accurate CT and 3D model um, completed for these guys. And so that's another obstacle of this project is trying to figure out how we can get a good model of these things and identify them to what they belong to. And so this is one of the most uh, best preserved uh, inclusions that we have. This is the first Hell Creek ant you guys have seen. And so he's, I, I really love ants, they're my favorite insect, but he's also incredibly preserved. You can see most of his body, the only thing he's missing is his butt. And so this gaster would be right here. We have the upper end of it. We have all his legs, we have his, um, have his antenna. And if we look a little closer, we actually have the really finely preserved palps. And so they're part of the mouth. They kind of help um, push food and help them um, experience the environment around him. These really fine features of the ant are visible and preserved. And if we look down here, there's a really cool um, function of the legs and antenna cleaner. They'll actually use that, bring their front leg up and clean their antenna off of parasites and other things. So it's cool, you can actually see that on the specimen. And if you look close enough, you, you can actually see an eye towards the back of the head here. And so you can actually see the compound eye of this, um, this ant, which is really awesome. And so it's a worker ant. Obviously, all worker ants are females. They're just kind of, they're there in the colony. They're not reproductive or anything. Um, and just based on the characters we are able to see, we uh, believe this is a type of formicine ant, which is a family of ant or a group of ants that are characterized by their butt, which we're actually missing. And so based on the, all the other characters, we can parse out it's possibly a formicine ant, but the, the big trigger characteristic of identifying these things is a cool feature on their gaster called the acidopore. And it's actually, so they don't have a stinger like other ants and hymenopterans like wasps. They actually have an acid butt. <laughs> and so these ants, as you sh with, with their name, form formicine, formic acid, they shoot formic acid out of the behinds in defense of their colony sometimes. And so I think it's really cool to imagine some sort of a, like a Hell Creek alvarosaur trying to get at an ant colony, but it's like all these ants are shooting formic acid at it. There's a lot of really cool stories that are, I, can, I think can be told within this amber. Here's another one. This is one of our well-preserved ones. Um, this is a type of wasp, probably in the order of Proctrupomorpha, which is just a really large um, clade of uh, parasitoid wasps, usually very small in size, because you can see the scale of our one, and it's pretty small. Yeah, so in most, I want to press this, a lot of these insects are incredibly small, like that little aphid, or um, hemipterin that I showed you earlier with the long proboscis and feeding mouth part, that thing, the length of it is the width of a credit card. So you can imagine, these things are incredibly small. They are so small, it's really, it, another thing trying to look at characters. You gotta have a really high powered microscope. And so he's really nicely preserved. Um, it's hard to see him because just at the angle he's at, but you can see his wings are there. You can see his wings partly. You can see his little antenna coming down here. You can see his um, uh, compound eye, but also, so this he's super small. And so far, we've only found small things. But right behind him, we have this guy. If you can see him, you can vaguely see the outline around him. This is a massive inclusion compared to the, it's nearly two to three times as large as that wasp just in front of it. So you can see possibly the head cavity with an antenna right here. These are possibly the palps or mandibles. Um, I, I have no idea what that structure is, but it's, it's, the thing is gone. It's decomposed, it's decayed. There's nothing left of him besides the mold he left behind. But I think this really goes to show that there are, there can be some bigger things preserved inside this amber. This um, thing kind of proves it. And then also that ant, that ant is um, a few millimeters in length as well. So it's a lot bigger than most of the things we're finding. There's another limb down in the right corner, possibly of this thing. And then, so, uh, for you vertebrate people, I saved the best for last for you guys. Um, we are coming across quite a few intriguing filament-like inclusions you can see on these four different slides. And so, right now, we're still analyzing these. We, have, we can't say anything about it right now because we just don't know. But some of them are very intriguing um, regardless and without saying. It's only a matter of time before we find hair and feathers inside this amber, which can tell us a lot about the integument of vertebrate creatures.
So let's come to the why. Like, why should I care? <laughs> it's, I've, I probably haven't made the best case for this anger because of just you know, the obstacles it's been taking to preserve it, conserve it, um, and then studying it too. It, there's a lot of different steps in there and a lot of this you know, requires time, it requires manpower and money. But there are a lot of great things we can learn from this. I hope I've already demonstrated the really cool things we can learn and important things we can learn. Because once again, I'm going to stress the point that 20 million year old, that, sorry, 20 million year gap that's between the late Cretaceous and the Paleocene. We know nearly nothing about the micro communities that were around at that time. And so Hell Creek Amber, I mean, right smack dab in the middle, right before that huge extinction um, event, we can, I think with enough work and manpower, we can figure out what happened to the insect communities and other uh, micro ecosystems, um, what happened to them at this KPG boundary? What was happening um, after uh, or in the late Cretaceous and what was happening afterwards in the uh, Fort Union formation? We have a continual sequence of rock from the Hell Creek into the Fort Union. And the Fort Union is really known for its coal seams and its organic mudstones. We just have to find the amber deposits. And so possibly we can really refine our data to what's happening for the KBG and what's happening after. And that's just to be a lot of future work there that I'm hoping um, to continue on in my research. Um, we can kind of connect it back to the modern day if we figure out what's happening to the insects in this really um, big mass extinction. We might be able to you know, make some hypotheses and correlate some things to modern extinctions. And so, although insects aren't um, suffering huge, um, comparatively huge extinctions compared to other animals like mammals and amphibians um, and reptiles, but they do form a really important part of our ecosystems and substantially they are decreasing in number, not so much spe species wise, but just abundance wise. So we're seeing less and less insects um, as the Anthropocene continues on. And so hopefully we, if studying Hell Creek Amber might inform us about how insects and micro communities are reacting to mass extinction events. So these extinction events that are affecting large megafauna, just like today. Nope. And so another important part I like to stress with this um, Hell Creek Amber project, that it's, a, it's providing a new venue um, and ac access to new paleontological and entomo uh, entomological work in the West. And so uh, the Hell Creek is a pretty accessible formation to be working in. And at the CCM, we have already involved uh, a multitude of volunteers and really cool projects involving um, a bunch of different people, involving a bunch of different techniques like 3D printing, um, volunteers in the lab, volunteers in the field. And we're hoping to collaborate with a bunch of different researchers. We really want to share these specimens with as many people as we can because, you know, there's, there's a lot of insects out there and only so many people um, that, that study just a few different genera. And so I really hope we can involve many different entomologists and other researchers to be looking at these, uh, this amber and helping us explore this really cool world that's been lost to us for millions of years. So I'd like to thank a lot of people for uh, this event. I'd like to thank the Perpy Museum who's hosted me multiple times um, and exposing my research on um, the Carter County Museum and the Carter County Geological Society. Um, this project wouldn't be possible without them. I'd like to thank Nate Carroll, Dr. Nate Carroll for uh, starting this project or in passing it down to me. Um, I'd like to thank Montana State University and their undergraduate scholars program for funding uh, this. And I'd also like to thank the Keck School of Medicine um, in LA for uh, providing access to equipment and helping us out in CT scanning. Okay, and so now I'll take questions if any of you um, have any prime um, questions you'd like to ask. So thank you. <laughs> In terms of percentage-wise, when you find amber, how many specimens tend to have something in them? So that's a great question. Uh, so um, it was asked how many, what's like the percent of amber that have specimens that we find. 
And the answer is, I have no idea. Because uh, we have really yet to be doing statistical analysis on the abundance of amber that we are collecting. We should be doing that at some point. We will be doing a study on um, figuring out how fossiliferous this amber really is. But you know, it, it's quite sparse. Collecting this amber it isn't like going out in the Hell Creek and collecting um, dinosaur fossils. It's a volumes game. Because you can't, when you're out in the field and you find a piece of amber, you can't see what's in there. So your best chance is to just collect as much as you can, make sure it conserve as much as you can, embed it, and survey. And so you're, the more specimens, you're, you're going to get more specimens with the more you collect. And so that's all I can say about that. <laughs> How long do the CT scans usually take for like, like, like yeah. a decent sized specimen that you would have? For yeah. Um, so it was asked how long uh, the process of CT scanning takes for some of these specimens. And it can definitely vary, especially on uh, the detail you want. And so the more detailed scan is going to take a lot longer. When we were popping that, uh, the small hemipterin with the huge mouth part coming off, that thing, you know, his length, his body length is the thickness of a credit card, but it took nearly six to eight hours um, of trying to do detailed scan. It, it can be really anywhere between a few hours to like quite a few hours. It just depends. Yeah, thank you. Um, I can't tell if we're getting questions from our online body or not. Thank you, Jacob. Just great job. Oh, oh, well, thank you. Thank you, people of the internet, the interwebs. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, definitely check out the Bourbon Museum website. We have a lot of really fun events coming up, including new lecture series. We have a fun new series of trivia nights um, happening at the beginning of every month. Don't forget about our haunted burpee um, happening towards the end of October. It's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of cool stuff like haunted houses and dissections, and trick or treating. So check us out and thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks,